and for me genius conductor. Only who make influence not for instrument. He conducting not instrument. He conducting musician. And that's different between genius conductor and not genius conductor. No genius conductor make only a rhythm and sometimes harder. Genius conductor hypnotize another musician for he understand emotion of conductor without his gesture even. I think his interpretations were for the ages. They were, they were amazing in their intensity, they were amazing in their drama, they were amazing in their passion. Um, he didn't look beautiful as a conductor, it wasn't, you know, he didn't have this great podium charisma, but he had the rest of his charisma that carried him through. And certainly training an orchestra, like this orchestra was so much his orchestra, um, the, the National Symphony. Um, because of the strength of his personality. So whether or not the downbeats were always where one expected, and believe me, they were pretty much all the time, the point was that he could sort of will out of the players the kind of sound world and intensity and, and ensemble that he wanted. Slava was a great musician, a great cellist, and a great conductor. I think the, the, the thing that people don't understand, he's also a great pianist. People don't realize this is also a good composer. <laughs> what people don't realize is the depth of his training when he was a young man. I mean, he studied composition with Shostakovich. I think he played piano up to the level of Rachmaninoff concerti. I, I understand, I may be wrong about that. I thought that he told me that he actually learned the Rachmaninoff second concerto. Um, and as he said to me, you know, he spent 20, 30 years sitting in the solo chair watching conductors from the very greatest to the mediocre. Anywhere near to describing Slava on the podium, he was great. He was all fire and guts on the podium and had impeccably good ears, uh, was a brilliant accompanist. There were two Slavas to me, sort of Slava Papa, was all hugs and encouragement and warmth and smiles and listened to any little issue that any little problem gave me advice. Fantastic. And then there was Slava, the teacher. And in, on the occasions where I will, I will never forget when he coached me on the uh, Dvorak cello concerto before we went to, to Russia. He was in his kimono in his house with his little doggy right next to him. Brutal, brutal. <laughs> I don't know how I got through it without crying. Very, very tough. Um, and he asked me to memorize, which I did, blah, blah, blah. But it was fantastic. It was tough love. It's, it's kind of like the Russian gymnasts, you know, and the Russian hockey team and the Russian musicians. It's tough love. But it was the sort of thing where I, it, it was never hateful. It was never, it was always, I have confidence in you, young man. I want you to get this and I'm not gonna settle until you do. And I'm gonna do anything, including humiliating you, to get you to do it, and he did.
I, I was prepared, I was totally prepared. Musically and psychologically. We get to the first rehearsal, which was here in DC, and mostly he was rehearsing the orchestra, and I was just waving my stick, which was fine. I, you know, he's the great Rostro Povich, I was a little puppy dog, you know, with long hair and cowboy boots. Uh, but he, uh, and I was kept expecting him to humiliate me, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, and he didn't. Then we had the second rehearsal in DC again. I'm all bracing myself, ready ready for a tough love. All smiles, all everything great, no, no, no problem. I even pulled him aside at some point before we flew to, uh, first to Japan, if you remember, and said, Slava, is everything I'm doing okay? Because I was so nervous, for God's sakes. No, no, Randichka, that's what he always called me, Randichka. No, it's fine, it's fine. We get to the rehearsal before the first performance in Japan, and he raked me over the coals. You probably have forgotten this. In front of the orchestra, it was it was like an hour, it was supposed to be a twenty minute sound check for for an hour and a half nonstop humiliation. Bay, I didn't do anything right for that ninety minutes, and I was furious. I loved him already, but I was furiously mad with him. Furious. And I'm like, you know, I'm throwing my tuxedo on. I'm going to show you, you. <laughs> and I walked out mad as hell and conducted the performance of my life. And afterwards, he and I got crazy drunk <laughs> together and a whole bunch of others went out totally just gaga. Uh, and I realized it in thinking thereafter, you know, he was a brilliant psychologist. At some point or other, he wanted me to ratchet my performing ability, my performing energy, everything that, that makes a champion. He wanted to get that welled up in me. And he used humiliation slash anger, my anger, to do it. And, and it worked. I, I walked out, I nailed the performance, I had high energy, I had grit, I had fire, and he seemed to be happy with me, which was all I was concerned about. In the 30 years of my professional career, by far the most difficult soloist I've ever had to deal with um, in terms of demanding nature was Slava, more difficult than anybody else. Um, it was great training. I mean, you know, I, the, the, the beginning, if you're in the late 80s, when we'd, we'd appear in, in other places, it was frightening, you know, it's like, you know, and it's, it's so funny, because he had the cello between his legs, he, he knew exactly what he wanted to be seeing. If you weren't delivering that, he was all over you, and especially, you know, given our relationship. I mean, the most important things he did right at the outset were introduce me to management, introduce me to his manager, have me come along as a guest conductor when he was a soloist. So at that point, I was completely green and completely unknown, frightened little kid. And, you know, he's performing in London and I'm making my London debut with whatever orchestra. I think some of the orchestras took slightly dim view of this because if you wanted Slava, you had to have Slava's assistant as the guest conductor for that concert. But, you know, it opened lots of doors. It was trial by fire. I mean, there's no question. The first time I ever conducted the Dvorak concerto in my life was with Slava in Carnegie Hall. So he didn't, uh, he, he expected you to rise to whatever challenge he threw at you, and I never got the sense he was worried about it. He trusted us to do what needed to be done, and I think all of us, certainly for me, it was an incredible challenge. We worked really, really hard, but it taught me a lot. It taught me about myself. It taught me what hard work could it help you achieve, and and challenges like that, I knew that if I could do that, then there were few challenges that would be more daunting in my career. To do the Dutia Concerto in London as my London premiere.
He had a wonderful way with Dvorak as well. I always felt that because of the Dvorak concerto and the closeness he felt to that piece, that he actually wanted to get into all the Dvorak symphonies. He did some of the unusual ones here. Whatever one thought of his interpretations, for example, his Beethoven was far from the authentic instrument practice that's now come, become de rigueur. It was, it was still honest and full of integrity, so you had to admire it. I remember his Schubert great C major, like it was yesterday. I remember, I remember being so surprised, because it's sort of clearly very classical, not Russian, not Shostakovich, not Tchaikovsky. It was brilliant, it was colorful, it was alive. He taught me a whole lot about conducting. He taught me not necessarily the physical stuff. He almost never talked about the physical stuff. Although I thought he had a remarkable gift for, he had a certain, there was something in his beat, like to get pizzicatos together and something. Maybe just as a cellist, he knew the impulse to give. I thought he had remarkably clear stick. Um, but I think for me personally, when I came here, I was not really familiar with the music of Shostakovich very much. I had not been terribly interested in it, I have to admit. I, I was not a Tchaikovsky fan. Russian music was not something I had spent a lot of time studying. I had French and German tradition teachers, uh, you know, very strict. So that repertoire was my core repertoire. And coming here and watching him, I think right away my first season, do some Shostakovich symphonies and the Tchaikovsky symphonies, opened up a whole world and it was not at all uh, familiar to me, and the depth with which he knew this world was remarkable, unbelievable. He would coach the actual technique uh, um, when I accompanied him. If I had fallen into some little mannerism or something that wasn't clear, he would say, Randichka, you know, close your mouth, or, you know, no, no, you need to conduct this this way. And then at certain crucial junctures, he would pull me inside and say, Randichka, how would you conduct this spot? And, and, and hopefully I had an answer. Uh, I said, no, you know, if it was a cadenza or was this or that. Mostly we would, we would talk musician to musician about the structure and shape and arc of 80% of the things I learned from him, I learned hearing his rehearsals. Slava had as deep an understanding of music as any human being to ever walk the face of the map. He got it. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, I don't, it's not to say that I interpret each piece, you know, that he did while I was with him the same way as he, I, you know, I've come to my own conclusions. But, but you could never argue that it was boring. It was compelling. It was gutsy. Uh, you know, he was a real man on that podium. There wasn't anything flashy or, you know, uh, you know, it was guts. And uh, no, some, it wasn't always pretty. He was a little lumbery sometimes, didn't always look perfectly balletic. But that's not what conducting is. Conducting isn't the pretty art of dancing elegantly on the podium so that the audience thinks you look great. Conducting is the art of drawing a, a powerful performance out of these human beings. And he did that brilliantly. And Slav was also a born teacher, so the, the, the notion of how to energize players, what to say in a rehearsal, how to get the idea of what he wants, the sound, the music, the passion, across was natural for him. I thought in, in rehearsal he was always kind of remarkably able to get straight to the point. You know, I grew up here and I had the good fortune around 1975, I think, when he first guest conducted here, to go to one of those concerts and to feel this kind of amazing personality and amazing electricity and an amazing kind of passion coming off of the stage. And I think he was a 
appointed music director almost immediately. I think, frankly, somewhat to the chagrin of Dorati, who was, I think, ready to retire but didn't expect this transition. But the, but the management, and I think they sensed the public, saw something and they were afraid somebody else would grab him and they grabbed him and so right away having grown up here I, I knew that this was going to be happening. This is the nation's capital. It was still a very political time. The Cold War was still going on and you know he had been forced to leave his home country and here he was in the capital city of the strongest country on earth and he felt a connection with the orchestra. They clearly wanted him right away. And that was for him kind of a dream come true, a natural fit. I mean, it was a, a, a platform for him in a city of the highest importance in the world. It was an orchestra that had not yet necessarily been ranked in the highest of the North American orchestras. And that was tailor-made for what I think he felt he could bring because he was a political presence in a certain way and he was a musical force to be reckoned with the likes of which they hadn't really seen in Washington DC and so the orchestra was kind of an orchestra waiting to happen in some ways I think you know Dorati we should never underestimate he did phenomenal things here and the Kennedy Center got built and, and so forth and the orchestra as I grew up here was an incredibly fun orchestra to come watch and to hear and to see it develop. But Slava was, I think, a gamble for the orchestra. He was untested as a conductor. But for him, it was also his sense of loyalty and friendship. He had debuted here. There had been incredible electricity and feeling on stage. He felt it too. And so he was willing to make a bond right away. And it was a bond that lasted, what? 20 years, 17 years as music director, but 20 years from that debut date. Some transport us beyond music to reveal the human soul. Such is Rostropovich. Art is bred, said Slava, essential. From his first breath, music was life. At the Moscow Conservatory, he won the highest prizes and the friendship and attention of the great Soviet composers. Shostakovich sparked his passion for contemporary music. Prokofiev thought the cello a crazy instrument. Slava helped change his mind. Even though Stalin's regime condemned the music of his mentors, Slava stood by them. Being around Rostropovich and hearing him talk about Shostakovich, which he did often, but just watching him interpret these pieces was a very, very important part of my, my education and my learning. And so um, I'm always talking about what he said should be done in a certain passage that I remember. I mean, you know, we all remember things like, must be like nails in brain and, you know, all of these sounds that, you know, this is not just a conductor saying, please play softer, please play louder. He always had unbelievable and sometimes very harsh metaphors for, for what he wanted to achieve and get the drama out of the music. At the end of the day, he knew what his place was in this process, that the grandest and most celebrated and most important genius is that of the composer, and that we, the performers, uh, even if we do it, our job brilliantly well, that spark of genius is really the top of the mountain. And, and that gesture is so beautiful that he always did that. If you had the experience I had of spending six years working closely with him, it's kind of impossible not to reference him in your brain quite often. I reference him a lot with the repertoire we've talked about, particularly Russian and Slavic repertoire. I sometimes reference him in, in his favorite catchphrase, soldiers for music, we are soldiers for music. But that implies commitment and that implies every concert is a kind of life or death experience. I think he, he really felt that every concert was 100% or you had no business being on the platform. 
no matter where the concert was, no matter what the conditions were, no matter how large the audience was, no matter how small the town. Nobody else ever said anything like that, you know. And I think it was more telling because, of course, when we all got to know Slava, the Soviet Union was still very much in existence. Um, and so just the idea of a Soviet soldier, you know, somehow made it even more intimidating, you know. Um, but the soldier for music idea is, um, is, is something that, I, you know, there are days where we all have them where you don't want to face the music. And, and you just having a soundtrack that plays that in your inner ear is... It's, it's all you need, because he would have darn well gotten up there and, got, and done it. I mean, you know, we know that he didn't want to get out of bed every day of the year. That's impossible. Nobody does. Yeah. But he never yeah, showed there, that. There's a whole other side to Slava where he did a lot of things not for money. He, he played, I was the music director of a little orchestra in Scranton, Pennsylvania when I first came here. It was kind of my first music directorship and it was very important to me and it was a quite a good community orchestra, partly professional kids came from New York and Philly and Slava knew about this and he said to me, when you're ready, I will come and play. And in fact, he did. No fee. Dvorak concerto, we flew him up, we flew him back, it was all compressed into about 48 hours. But he did that f f for, for me as his new assistant, not as an old friend. And he did that kind of thing, there was no press here in Washington about it at all. I mean, they were thrilled, they still remember it up in Scranton and Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. He played Haydn uh, D major, it was electrifying for a packed audience it was a huge help to us financially because we could charge a big ticket price. This is the one only time Mstislav Rostropovich played in Kingston, New York. You know, place was packed, 1,400 people. Of course, they screamed for him at the end. He played three encores, three in Kingston, New York, not not having received a nickel for that night, for no other reason but that he and I were friends and the audience wanted it. I saw it from a distance, you know, it was, it was for me, uh, there have been several times where I've wept openly. You know, I wept openly watching the news that day and when he died. I wept openly when I was actually in Sydney, Australia, when I heard the news that he died and I just sat and wept. Mm -hmm. You know, the scenes of the crowds at the stage door with flowers, I mean, that was freaky. I mean, we don't have that in this country and that was just, yeah, I, everybody saw that and everybody was like, my dear family, my dear friends, here, our orchestra family, here our world family from Kennedy Center, we come in this music, we united in this music, humanity, from two greatest countries in the world, 
the United Humanity of United States, uh, United States, America, and Russia, and Soviet Russia. In this moment, my friends, I would like to tell you my appreciation, my gratitude from the bottom of my heart, because you make music, you make Russian music in city today and yesterday, when both greatest Russian composers were born. born, excuse me, not born, because we are born in Nipropetrovsk, in Solzhenka, but both composers finished Leningrad Conservatory. Prokofiev finished Leningrad Conservatory and Shostakovich. Friends, thank you very much. I would like what you, God bless you, God bless America. I would like if then God bless my country. We have here many difficulties. And I would like if this country, these great people, how you see these people, you consider it. With these people coming for a fantastic, happy future. And for friendship between these two countries, I would like to give all my life. Friends, thank you very, very much for yes. ending this talk. I, like I say, in rehearsals often I'll say, well, you know, Slava used to do this or used to do that. Uh, he's a presence in my mind and in my heart ongoing. Slava's still alive, you know, in me. You know, the first note, for example, of any recording of the Prokofiev Symphony or Constant of his makes me cry. Just the first note. You know, it doesn't matter which one you put on of the versions he's made. It's a human voice. Yeah. It's, and with pain. No, it's a human voice of pain. It's, it's truly, it was truly extraordinary. And the last concert I did with him was at the Kronberg Music Festival. This was probably 2003, maybe, something like that. I'd have to look. Um, we did a world premiere at that point in his life. We did Rodion Shadrin's short concerto written for him. Uh, and we did Dvorak at that festival, and he was still, you know, when it was, whenever it was a cello festival, you know, he was a powerful, powerful presence, and he did many performances and classes. And I would hope that Slava is remembered as a conductor the way he's remembered as a cellist, that, that you know, a, a man that had a profound impact on the orchestral landscape. He commissioned works, he, he connected orchestras to music that they maybe didn't have a strong connection to, and he connected audiences to you know, a vast repertoire that he, he learned as deeply as he learned the cello repertoire. He learned it much later in his life. He didn't learn all of it, none of us does, but, but, he, but the stuff he chose to learn and the stuff he chose to conduct and the stuff he felt passionate about you know, he, he brought it to thousands in a very personal and I think very important and very lasting way. He elevated the level of the National Symphony status from very good to world class. He did it in a number of ways. The, the hires, the, the musicians that he hired, he had a, an amazing ear for talent. And he knew what he wanted, because I remember it, I attended many, many auditions. And there were a lot of times it would be down to two or three people and one, one was just a little bit too soloistic or one was just a little bit too this or didn't like the way this phrase shaped or that phrase. He, he knew who to hire who would blend perfectly into that section. So, so superior musicianship in terms of hiring great musicians. And then at the end of the day, he was just such a great musician, such a great human being. The inspiration that came from him never stopped. Uh, and it was never boring to rehearse with Slava. It was never boring to tour, to perform, or to record with him. And that kind of dynamic energy and supreme musicianship elevated this orchestra to the world-class status that you now enjoy. He was always very 
proud of all of us that he'd chosen to be his assistants and and backed us to the hilt. And, you know, of course, at times I think, you know, am I living up to what he expected of me? You know, none of us has the talent he had, you know, let's be honest. I'm not saying anything unusual by saying that. And, and so just his stamp of approval was what we all sought. You know, I always felt that it was there. I, I would hope that, that you know, as I've grown older, and if he were still here, he'd he'd smile and acknowledge that you know he picked a guy that knew what, knew what he was doing and made a life in music that had a had a little impact.